Hi, I'm going to talk about the importance of benchmarking in business excellence in today's world. Uh, my name is Dr. Robin Mann from the Centre for Organisational Excellence Research in New Zealand. Uh, before I start my presentation, I wish to thank uh, Lars Sorkfess for his invitation to present today. Uh, I also wish to congratulate Sandham Associates for all the tremendous work it's been doing over the last 50 years in Sweden and internationally. And hopefully you'll have at least another 50 successful years. Just checking my watch there just to make sure um, I've started my stopwatch. Okay, so in my presentation, I wanna focus on benchmarking and business excellence. And this is really from the perspective of our work in New Zealand, uh, looking at these topics. Our research is international. And uh, I believe if I share with you the research we're doing, and the work we're doing internationally around the world, it'll give you a great perspective and greater understanding of these two topics and also their importance. So if I just go to the next slide, you can see better who the Centre for Organisational Excellence Research are. Uh, we com are composed really of three separate entities. We have a research arm based in Massey University, where we do doctorate research, uh, we also have uh, BPR.com Limited, which is a, a company that uh, uh, collects best practice and benchmarking data and information and disseminates that to businesses to help them to improve an organization, join that resource, to become a member of it. So I'll share that with you later on. And then I'll talk about some of the consultancy work we do and the projects we do to encourage organize and help organizations become excellent and to help organizations undertake benchmarking to find and implement uh, best practices so that's what's in store with you in store for you okay um, so we're based in the north island of new zealand so koa massey, massey university for example is based in palmerston north i live about an hour 15 minutes away from that in a small sort of beautiful place called wanganui uh, at the moment, in terms of our research centre, we have two PhD students. Normally, we'd hope to have more than this, but because of the COVID situation, it's very difficult to bring additional students to New Zealand at the moment. New Zealand's quite closed off. But as of next year, once we have the majority of the population uh, vaccinated, then um, we'll welcome, again, um, international students to join us in, in New Zealand. So Saad has just recently completed his PhD from a research perspective. He's just had his examination. So you can see here Saad in the middle. You can see by him um, is myself. Hopefully you can identify me there. And also by Saad is like the is a co supervisor, um, Professor Nigel Grigg. There's another co supervisor, Dr. Sanji Mafrani, you can't see on this picture. In terms of the examiners, there, there's, you can see Wayne McPherson with a white shirt. Uh, and also in the background on the, on the screen, uh, you can see two international examiners who joined us. Uh, one, many of you may know in Sweden. One is Professor Anders Funden from the Swedish Institute of Quality and uh, from Malauden University. And we also have Dr. Ala Gerard, who's from University of Portsmouth in the UK. So as a result of that examination, they were asking questions to Saad about his research, that already read his thesis, and uh, basically he needed to show that uh, he's got good knowledge around the subject and um, it could provide additional information as required in terms of his research. And from that um, sharing, um, uh, the examiners were pleased with the research that was undertaken. And uh, based on just now a few changes he needs to make, which happens with most thesis, he'll then sort of resubmit and uh, then he'll then, then move from being Mr. Saad Gaffel to Dr. Saad Gaffel. So well done to, to him. Uh, Saad's research was looking at the role of business excellence custodians. Therefore, looking at the role of organizations like the Swedish Institute of Quality in terms of promoting excellence and getting organizations to understand what is excellence and how to use these excellence frameworks to guide them on the journey towards world class performance. A very important research because um, you may have heard that, uh, depends on the country you're from, uh, there's been various levels of success 
in terms of getting organizations to understand and use these frameworks. So really the purpose of this, this research is to find out, you know, what are the best practices, which countries can be learned from in terms of how they're promoting excellence and helping organizations on, on that journey. Um, to start off his research, Saad did um, a literature review and uh, he identified that there were 382 business excellence papers that have been peer reviewed and published in academic journals. And you can see them all shown here on the, the bar graph. And you can see that uh, the most popular year in terms of the number of publications was in 2019 with 29 publications, followed by 2011 with 26 publications. So you can see generally the number of publications has been increase, increasing in recent years. Maybe it's plateaued now looking at the shape of the graph. But uh, from a researcher's perspective, it's never been a more popular sort of subject. Um, and yet this might not reflect exactly what's happening in business because um, in some countries, um, uh, the, the, for instance, the awards process is no longer. In some countries, there, seem, there seems to have been decline in interest in business excellence. Uh, certainly not the case across all countries, but in some countries that's evidently the case. And what happens with research, research usually lags behind uh, what's happening in, in business, you know, what's happening in real life. Because to do a PhD, you know, and do a research project, it takes three or four years. And then you know, even after that, you might be publishing papers, which might take another two years to get published. So there could be a time lag, three, four, five years, six years from something happening in the business world to really getting good research data you know, in terms of it in, in the academic world. So it'll be interesting to see over the next few years how this uh, scenario develops. Um, this this uh, information, this table will be very useful for people doing research in business excellence. It shows the list of journals in order of the highest citation rates for business excellence papers. So it's showing if you published an academic paper on business excellence, for instance, in the Journal of Operations Management, it's likely your research would be cited 12 times by other researchers. This is important to know because more, it's more the case than ever now that uh, if you want to be a successful researcher and get promotion from a university, you've got to be able to demonstrate that your research is having an impact in the, in the academic and business world. And one way to do that is by by showing that your research has been cited many times by your researchers. Um, so if we look at these top uh, journals where business excellence papers get cited, we can see Journal, journal of Operations Management number one, followed by the International Journal of Production Research, followed by the International Journal of Operations Pro Production Management, followed by the International Journal of Quality and Reliability Management followed by total quality management and business excellence. Um, what's interesting about this as well is if, if you look at this, you can see in um, the column over here, the number of uh, papers that, have, that this information is based on. So five business excellence papers have been published in the Journal of Operations Management, five in International Journal of Production Research, and five in International Journal of Operations and Production Management. So actually to get published in those journals is very, very difficult. And because these are, have a really rigorous process in terms of um, ex the acceptance of, of, of journal papers. And maybe as well, to a degree, those journals are um, uh, the, the, the field of topic is a bit wider than the business excellence area too, and this is why they have less papers. But generally, if you publish in those journals, they will get a higher citation rate, but it's difficult to do. And this is why um, um, many researchers would then publish in journals with sort of a, a lower, lower ranking from an academic perspective and publish in, in journals like the International Journal of Quality Liability Management and Total Quality Management and Business Excellence. So you can actually see here that the Total Quality Management and Business Excellence journal has had the highest number of business excellence papers published in there, 89, followed by, in fact, the TQM journal, 38, and followed by the International Journal of Quality and Liability Management. Um, 
So that gives you some perspective of the sort of um, the journals that uh, uh, an academic should be publishing in and, and that gets the highest citation rates. In, in terms of the research itself, um, so Saad was looking at the role of business excellence custodians, therefore the role of organisations like the Swedish Institute of Quality, therefore looking at what role do they play in terms of you know, exciting organisations about business excellence and getting them to commit resources, uh, getting them to learn about uh, business excellence, go to training courses, maybe undertake business excellence assessments, and maybe use some tools and techniques, quality tools and techniques to help them to improve. And what you can see here is that a business excellence custodian's role is twofold. One is to really decide on what business excellence model or models should be used in their country. And secondly, then to um, deploy you know, awareness about those frameworks and get organizations to use them. And then ultimately, um, uh, provide recognition to those organizations that excel when accessed by those frameworks. So um, in, in terms of the models to use, there are well-established models like the Baldridge Excellence Framework and the EFQM model. So many countries would decide to use those because they're already internationally recognized on a lot of uh, research and um, effort goes into their design and they, put, they carry a lot of credibility and also if you are using them um, if, if you encourage organizations to use them in your country then it's more likely that when those organizations uh, export and um, uh, try to develop relationships with organizations outside their country that uh, you know the uh, their, their, their sort of experience and their, their maturity in terms of excellence will mean something if they can say, um, you know, our organization's been assessed by the EFQM or the Baldridge framework, and we were, you know, uh, recognized at a certain level. So this is why uh, often many countries decide to use these, these frameworks rather than develop one themselves. Also, another consideration if a country develops a model themselves, You've got, you've got to put a lot of resource and effort in terms of establishing the credibility of that framework. And so my general advice would be to use the international frameworks and that additional resource, I would say, would be better spent in terms of the deployment side, in terms of creating awareness of the frameworks, providing assistance to organisations on the journey to excellence and on the awards process. And the reason why, you know, that these frameworks are used is because uh, to, to, to improve economic competitiveness, you know, for, for societal benefits, because these frameworks are designed to um, uh, in, in, increase your, um, in, in, increase satisfaction, increase your results for your stakeholders, whether it's customer satisfaction, financial results, whatever it may be. So the, the, the frameworks are designed to achieve fantastic stakeholder results for your organization. And so the idea is if we got as many organizations as possible in a country using these frameworks, using these very valid frameworks, then the whole sort of business results for the whole economy would improve. Therefore, productivity would increase in the competitiveness of your country in comparison to others would increase. Also, the societal benefits in terms of sustainability, and environmental benefits would uh, become better because that's a key uh, result that's looked at in terms of these frameworks. For this particular study, um, Saad looked at including 57 countries, because 57 countries have a national business excellence award. Uh, but we were lucky enough actually to get 26. We didn't get all 57, but 26 is a very high number of countries to get involved in research like this, uh, especially at the business ex excellence custodian level. So we have 26 countries involved. They were all involved in, in completing these very rigorous surveys and half were involved in follow-up uh, structured interviews. Uh, let's share some of the key findings from, from this research. Um, so we're looking at how these business access custodians, you know, basically assisted organizations to use these frameworks. 
And uh, therefore, we looked at all these the deployment processes or the deployment services that I shared with you earlier. So one of the key deployment services is a recognition service, you know, their award service. And you can see here for awards, there's that you can break it down into sort of eight, about 18 distinct services as part of that award service. And we were asking the business excellence custodian to say, well, how good do you perceive your service to be? And uh, we, if, if they gave an answer that did not seem to be reflective of other answers they gave in the survey, I say we'd follow up with that and we'd challenge them on that. Or when we um, talk to them on the, 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 for, the for those uh, organizations, business access custodians, or we did a follow up structured interview, we would also question them again to, to try and validate the data as much as we could. So what you can see here that for the award services, they were saying that in particular, uh, the site visits to award applicants was very well received. The award ceremony was very well received. So these are scoring over four points and from a scale of five, four means good, five means excellence, three means average. Also consensus meetings were highly valued in terms of a way of getting assessors to understand better you know, the strengths and opportunities of an organization, understand better the organizational profile, and then reach consensus with other assessors on what the score for that organization should be. Um, in terms of the areas for award services that could be improved across these 26 countries, uh, they were primarily publicity to encourage award applications, publicity surrounding the awards, and the launch event for the award. When we looked at the facilitation services, this gave uh, a slightly different picture in that uh, generally business excellence custodians were scoring themselves lower. And so 3.3 is just above average for these services that they perceived, you know, how, how well they're performing these services. So the service which they performed the best at, they said was business excellence assessor training courses. Uh, secondly, business, business excellence certification programs. Thirdly, the Business Excellence Awards at the national level. Fourthly, workshops and seminars in business excellence. So this is what they felt they were good at, but they were not so good at online social platforms for business excellence forums or discussions. They were not so good at industry-specific business excellence guides. They were not so good at online services or databases providing business excellence information or benchmarking information. And they didn't provide many opportunities for sharing and learning from organizations from different countries. Okay, we go to the next area, awareness. We can see here an even lower score of 3.1. So this is saying that uh, most business excellence custodians believe that their awareness services were just average. And the awareness services they were best at were workshops training on business excellence, providing free copies of the criteria, obtaining the assistance of organizations that are already uh, used business excellence to promote business excellence, and marketing of business excellence to managers and employees. The areas that they were perceived to be the weakest at were encouraging industry membership based associations to promote business excellence to their members, encouraging tertiary institutions to promote and teach business excellence to their students, encouraging schools to promote and teach business excellence to their pupils. Um, they didn't think they particularly good at press release on business excellence. So, so all this information really gives a picture of what's happening across the world in terms of, you know, the activities of business excellence custodians and what they're good at and what they're not so good at. So you can see across the world, generally most are quite confident about the credibility and the rigor and, um, uh, you know, of their award services. But in terms of helping organizations on the journey, not so good, not as not strong, and even less so in terms of promotion and awareness. So this really helps to explain why in some countries, maybe there has been over time a decline in interest in, in business excellence, because there has not been enough focus on business excellence awareness, or even helping organizations on that journey. Really, you need to be continually, you know, having a large pool of organizations 
at the awareness level who then become sort of users of the framework to then generate uh, you know the award winners um, and there seems to have been some disconnect between those services when we look at the Swedish Institute of Quality it's a little bit different uh, again um, there's an acknowledgement that the strongest service is around awards but in this case you're also saying that the next strongest service is on business excellence awareness and less so on business excellence facilitation so that's quite interesting and it'd be worthwhile um so having a discussion around that from a swedish position and saying what more could be done in particular to uh, you know facilitating organizations on the journey uh, to excellence I think what is quite quite unique about the Swedish approach is that I, I believe through the Swedish Institute of Quality, you have all the universities involved in some way supporting the Swedish Institute of Quality. And so that, that's, that's a great way to get uh, research in this area, a great way to involve uh, younger people, younger researchers as well in business excellence. And I think the universities can do an excellent job in terms of promoting business excellence too. So that's quite unique, I'm not aware of other countries with that level of engagement from an academic perspective in, in terms of excellence. So the findings from this research have been already published in free journals, which are accessible here, and uh, the links are shown here. Um, and we have more papers to follow too. Also, you can email me after watching this presentation and I'd ha be happy to send you a copy of those papers if you can't get access uh, to them through the journals themselves. The second area of PhD research, which again, I think is really important to do is more at the organizational level. And this is looking at, you know, the organizational excellence architecture required to support an organization's business excellence journey. So this is sort of saying, if you're a, an organization just starting the journey to excellence, what do you need to put in place to kickstart your approach, you know, to get that initial engagement and to sustain that journey until you become, you know, a highly mature, excellent organization and perhaps, you know, become uh, an award winner. And through initial research by Atif, he's identified that the organizational excellence architecture should consist of four key elements or four key pillars. One looks at structure. And we're talking here about uh, sort of a new structure that you have to put in place to support excellence, like having a steering committee, like having a business excellence department, or using business excellence teams, or having business excellence champions. So, you know, it's, it's asking a question, what needs to be put in place from a structural perspective to make business excellence happen? Because there's been no research on this previously. Secondly, we're asking a question, well, what resource is required? to support this business excellence effort. Um, for instance, you know, what resources required in terms of uh, for, for training of, of your people? Um, do you need resource to engage business excellence, consult, con, business excellence consultants? Um, do you need additional resource for um, improvement projects stemming from business excellence assessments or for purchasing um, assessment tools? You know, so, so resources are obviously key as well. Uh, we also look at other processes related to business excellence. Um, so that, that would be business training, that would be internal communication. How do you, how do you communicate uh, to all your employees that you're on the business excellence journey, whether indeed you communicate it or not, how strongly do you communicate it? Um, also looking at, you know, do you have a rewards and recognition process around business excellence internally or not to encourage people to um, perhaps get engaged in some of the activities that you set up around business excellence. So it's looking at those key processes that you need to put in place. And finally, it's looking at the assessment tools you use. Um, you know, should you use assessment tools? What type of assessment tools should you use, whether they're facilitated, whether they're external assessments, um, and how often should they be undertaken? So this is what we're, we're calling the, the organizational excellence architecture. Um, this, this is, our team study is, 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 is now just started its second year. There's still an opportunity to participate. 
And so if your journey is already on, the, if your organization is already on the journey to business excellence, then please do go to the bpr.com website. Uh, just do a quick search for business excellence research and you should find uh, this survey link. It was also written on the slide as well. And uh, please you know, complete that survey and tell us your story about how you're trying to implement business actions inside your organization. I think it says on the website, the survey is only open to the 31st of August, but um, that's wrong actually, we're still open. So please do participate if you can. Um, so we're trying to get all organizations that are on a business actions journey to participate. Uh, whether you're starting a journey or really more advanced and already a Business Excellence Award winner. Um, obviously, if you're a Business Excellence Award winner, you've got more to share. And we want to learn about, you know, your, you know how you achieved, um, you know, becoming a Business Excellence Award winner. You know, what journey did you take? How did you undertake that journey? And did your organisation, like excellence architecture, need to change based on the level of maturity level that, that you were at? at various points in time. So you can see here, we have initially described different levels of business access maturity. I'm not gonna go through them, but again, if you actually go to that survey, uh, you, there will be a description of these different levels and you can decide what level your organization is currently at. So, so far we've had 51 organizations around the world complete the survey. And uh, the majority of those organizations have actually been organizations which have achieved a level of recognition on excellence. Um, we've had um, organizations, say, from different countries participate. Um, uh, we've had most recipients from, uh, or respondents from the United Arab Emirates and Singapore. Uh, the respondents have been equally placed between private sector and public sector. Uh, the majority have been users of the EFQM model. Secondly, the Dubai Government Excellence model. Thirdly, the Singapore Business Excellence Framework. And fourthly, the Baldrige Criteria, although the Singapore framework really mirrors the Baldrige Criteria. So yeah, you potentially could combine them and say, in fact, Baldrige was the most popular framework. I'll just show you an insight into sort of the questions we're asking and some of the data we're getting back. Um, uh, what we found out is that the majority of business excellence or, or organizations have undertaken a business excellence assessment or undertake a business ex excellence assessment within a one year time frame. So either they take them, you know, at the end of the year, or take an assessment at the end of the year, or they have a real time assessment so they can obtain at any point in time information on their strengths, opportunities for improvement and a business excellence score. So whilst it says here at the top of the slide, 39% have an annual assessment and 22% have a real-time assessment, that means in total, 61% would be having a business excellence assessment within a one year time period. Um, we are investigating this data in more detail to see whether, for instance, um, the frequency of assessment changes dependent on the level of maturity of an organization. So um, I could share you information on that now, but we're not gonna have time, but that's the sort of information we're looking at and will be shared later on in some of our academic research papers. This is very interesting. Um, that one of the questions we, we asked firstly was, did our sort of definition of organization, excellence architecture, did it make sense? And were those four pillars you know, or do, do they seem sensible or not? And the general feedback we got got from that was was yes. I mean, we made we've made some changes, slight changes to it, but the feedback was generally yes. This is why, again, I'd encourage you to complete the survey because if you differ from uh, what we found out so far, we'd love to hear it and have your views because this is ongoing research. It's it, the, you know the, the our findings will change continually as we get more data and we get more information. But, but, but what's important here is that even though we sort of identify what we believe to be sort of the, an, an initial conceptual model of organizational excellence architecture, um, we believe there's, 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 there's a number of factors that will have an impact on how you, on, on the organizational excellence architecture you use inside an organization based on 
let's say these four factors here, which you can see. So uh, the organization like Excellence Architecture for an organization starting the journey, for instance, is likely to be different than an organization like Architect, organization like Excellence Architecture that's been on the journey to excellence for four, five, six, seven years. And this is the feedback we got. So you can see here on these bars in green, when somebody agrees that um, the organizational excellence architecture um, will need to change based on uh, certain factors. So we can see that 85% um, of respondents were saying that the organizational excellence architecture will need to, to change depending on the level of maturity of the organization, which sort of makes sense. 81% sort of agree that the organization excellence architecture will need to change based on the size of the organization, which again makes sense. Um, for a very small organization, it's unlikely to have a business excellence department, but a large organization may well have a business excellence department. Also, 68% said uh, the industry type will have an influence too. So that's quite interesting. We want to investigate that more and find out. Uh, uh, why why that is the case and uh, you know so it, it could be for instance that uh, the, the, the type of architecture required um, you know for the for the public sector for 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 a hospital might need to be different from you know in 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 the private sector for uh, you know, an organization in fast fast moving consumer consumable goods and if, if if so, why? You know what 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 are what is impacting that? Uh, the another one which is easy to understand is is uh, the last one, speed. So uh, seventy four percent agreed that it depends on the speed with which you want to implement business excellence will impact the organizational excellence architecture. So therefore, if you want if if you have a commitment from your senior management team saying. Look, we want to dramatically improve our level of business access maturity within the next two to three years, then you can understand that there be, might be a much larger investment in business excellence, business excellence, maybe even getting consultants in initially, um, you know, and uh, uh, a really strong investment in training, initially with everybody trained, rather than a more sort of gradual approach if the speed was not as critical an issue. So that gives you an inkling of some of the research we're doing on, on excellence. Um, I'll now talk about uh, one, of, one of the companies that we have, which is BPR.com Limited. This resource here shares benchmarking and best practice in business excellence information. The resource has been around for 20 years now, but uh, we relaunched the resource in June. The old platform that it was based on was quite old and it was restricting us in terms of the services we could provide. This, this resource is very unique. We provide lots of curated, very good research information inside the resource. Uh, the majority of the research is not done by our organization. It's done by other organizations around the world. We've identified some important research and therefore asked for permission to host it on our own website resource. What's unique about it is that all the information is searchable via the criteria of, of the various business excellence models. So you can see here down the left-hand side that all the um, information is searchable, for instance, by the African excellence model, the Australian model, the Baldridge model, the EFQM model, new and old. Um, and so this becomes very useful for those organizations which understand excellence and have got an opportunity for improvement and want to learn best practices because they can search our platform and then find um, um, examples of best practices for the particular area of weakness that they have. And you can see on along the top of the slide how they can do the search. They can search across all our databases in one go, or they could search latest news, award winners, best practice reports, case studies, etc. Um, here is shown a more refined search. So uh, in this case, the EFQM model has been selected, as you can see in the left-hand panel and uh, a, a particular criteria has been selected called defined purpose and vision. And then um, uh, a search has been done specifically on case studies 
looking at good examples from organizations of how they define their purpose and vision, and therefore can we as an organization learn from them. So in this case, there's examples from Tetra Pak, from the city of Germantown in Tennessee, and also uh, an example from Memorial Hospital and Healthcare Center in the United States. Um, this is another part of the resource called Tools and Techniques. Inside the resource is over a thousand tools and techniques an organization could use to improve performance. And in this case, we've done a search for innovation tools and techniques. And this is providing examples of different tools and techniques, such as business inc incubators, dynamic innovation, organizational learning, radical innovation, and the theory of invented problem solving. <coughs> and you can then click on those links find more information about the tools and approaches, um, to find case studies and how organizations have applied those tools and techniques. And, and you know, there's so much information and resources. In addition, um, you know, to all our members, we provide regular best practice reports on specific topics. These are very short reports and uh, give you a good understanding of that topic. Again, with case studies, self-assessment tools. This one, for instance, is on um, for the leadership area, vision and mission and values. And so it's, it's all the information is easily digestible in these, these reports. But if you want further information, click on a link which will take you to the website and you can get to um, say that, that additional information for PDFs or videos, video presentations, uh, whatever is there to, 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 to help you on the journey. Um, the other thing about the new website is that um, we can have a networking area. So it's quite basic at the moment. You'll see over time it develop even more. So again, this is going to be a great resource for helping you to uh, find benchmarking partners. You can also add best practices yourself to the BPIR too. So th this is, we believe, will provide great assistance to your organisation to learn uh, and improve. Uh, so yes, I'm going to encourage you to join the BPR.com. It's only 10 US dollars per month. So uh, please do support us. Uh, in fact, you know, it's this, we, we're actually not making money from the resource. The we've plowed a lot of investment into this. So uh, really, we need your support to, to make this even stronger, even, even better. Um, so any, 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 any support will, will, will assist us. But um, anyway, in any case, we can provide you with one month's free access uh, if you would like. And so just send, send an email to that email address uh, and uh, we can provide you with free access to get your, your feedback uh, on it. Um, so you're most interested in, in that. So the other area of work that we do is in consultancy, training and uh, running major events on business excellence and best practices. So for instance, we run the International Best Practice Competition, uh, recently completed that a few months ago, and uh, it was uh, held on Zoom. So any organization around the world could participate without having to attend the actual event. Um, but it was sort of hosted from New Zealand to, to some extent. So you can see it says Wellington 2021. Uh, we also hold um, conferences around the world. We were uh, I, I served as a, a chairman um, with the Abu Dhabi Chamber of Commerce. So we co-hosted what's called the Global Organizational Excellence Congress in 2018. Again, we're looking to run that again, maybe in the next couple of years with the Abu Dhabi Chamber. Uh, huge event. We had 1,300 attendees for that. So very, very successful. It's just a shame the pandemic stopped us running it uh, again. So the International Best Practice Competition I think is, in, is of interest because it shows really the importance of benchmarking because, you know, how do you show a particular practice is a best practice? Well, you show a best practice is a best practice by um, providing um, some validity as a best practice. And that can be through showing certainly your, your results or performance results have improved as a result of implementing that practice. But it also would like to see that uh, uh, when developing that best practice, perhaps you've learned from other organizations that made uh, adaptations to that practice to, to better meet the needs of your own um, organizational culture or, or customers. And uh, in fact, you would have even hopefully improved on the results from that practice in comparison to your um, 
benchmarking partners. So we're looking for, for some evidence, really, that this is a best practice. The, the evidence could also be from peer review that you have been assessed. And uh, the assessors have said, based on their experience of looking at many similar practices, they consider your practice as uh, outstanding. So the for the international best practice, we look at all those elements as shown here, the criteria. And we also then, based on that criteria, uh, give an organization a certification and uh, from seven stars down to one star, um, with four stars meaning a local best practice, anything higher than that means it's an international best practice. So the recent international best practice competition um, earlier this year, we had 68 um, entries um, qualified to the presentation round from around the world. So these were all pretty high standard uh, applications. And then from that, we had, I think, five winners, which reached seven star classification. And one of them was Siha Ambulatory Healthcare Services from Abu Dhabi. And the, their best practice was on uh, their COVID-19 national drive through screening centers. And as you can see here, it's, that SIHA constructed 18 drive through screening hubs across the seven Emirates of U United Arab Emirates within 15 days. The first one went up within three days. So this was very fast uh, construction of these screening centers. And based on actually a lot of benchmarking over countries around the world, in particular, they learned from the, the Korean approach for uh, their screening centers. But uh, what was impressive about how the UAE did this is, you know, not only how they benchmarked against other countries before deciding on their particular approach, but then they improved on, you know, the Korean model. So you can see on the slide here uh, some differences in terms of performance of the UAE approach compared with the Korean model. Um, there's lots of also interesting improvements which are actually not shown on the slide. For instance, you know, for the UAE approach, even when you're in the car driving to this drive through screening centers through an app or through the radio, uh, you can hear instructions of what is required and what to expect, uh, you know, when you arrive there. So you're fully prepared uh, for, for what's going to eventuate. Um, so this is a great best practice to, to learn from, particularly how they deployed that best practice so, so quickly and so effectively. And uh, all this best practice and others is shown on the bpr.com and can be listened to by video. Uh, another aspect of work that we do is we work with countries at a national level in terms of their business excellence and benchmarking programs. In, in, you know, in, in particular, their overall strategy of how to engage organizations on this journey based on the research that we're doing as a center. So we're using the research, for instance, that SAD, the PhD student is doing, to help advise countries around the world on what they should be doing. I think, you know, what is often forgot, forgotten about uh, with business excellence models is they're not just business excellence models. You can call them also productivity models. They can also, they're also uh, models for, you know, driving sustainable development. So they're getting more and more closely related to, for instance, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So, I, I think in, from a promotional perspective, we're not necessarily promoting them in the right way because um, th these are, if we want to be successful as economies and societies, these are the models which can deliver that if a large group of organizers, a large assemblage of organizations from each country starts to use these models. So if you look at productivity as value of output over value of input, and essentially, you know, frameworks like the Baldrige model or the FQM model. Again, you're looking at two, two, two main factors, your business enablers and your business results, inputs and outputs. And you're trying to achieve more with less, you know, get more, um, become more effective in, in terms of, you know, meeting your, your stakeholders' results and achieving better stakeholder results. So uh, for me, I think this is not, it's understood by some countries, but, but not by all countries. If you want to improve productivity, and most countries would say they want to do that, then they certainly should be looking at excellence models as, as a way to assist organizations to become more productive. And also for countries which 
of focusing on uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, again, these models help to deliver that because all the models have a, have a strong focus on societal benefits, using resources appropriately. Um, it, it's taken into account the impact on society as a whole. So from our research, we can then advise countries in terms of you know, the roadmap to excellence at a national level in terms of the types of assessment services that can be offered at a national level and also the capability building services. And um, you can have a look at these later. These are just examples, many of these are generic examples of business capability building services. Finally, what I want to bring to your attention is a work that we do on, on benchmarking, where we actively assist organizations to do benchmarking. Now, um, we are the founders of the Trade Best Practice Benchmarking Methodology. It's a very systematic approach to benchmarking. It's really, the methodology itself is nothing new. I mean, it's most of the benchmarking methodologies are quite similar, but it's, uh, I guess, a bit more prescriptive. It's a bit easier to understand. And it's got more sort of tools and uh, approaches to assist you to do a benchmarking project in a professional approach. So if you're doing the, using this methodology, you'd be tremendously supported in how to use it through um, um, sort of the, the, the guidebooks around the methodology and the various tools and techniques. Um, what you can't see at the moment from this is that, well, we've got five stages of trade. It's called trade, by the way, because it's about trading information and knowledge. Benchmarking is never one way of learning. You always have benchmarking partners. And so this is emphasizing the name of trade. You should be trading information and knowledge between your partners so that you can both learn from each other. Uh, but say so underneath these major five stages, there are also steps. So this is why it's quite, quite prescriptive. So underneath the, the terms of reference stage, I think there's nine steps, so on and so forth. So you go through um, the project stage by stage and step by step. Some other stages and steps can be done in parallel, but ultimately you should be going through all the stages and steps. I think what's not understood about benchmarking is that uh, a lot of people think benchmarking is just learning from other organizations or even just uh, doing performance benchmarking, just comparing data between organizations. It's not, it's much more than that. Benchmarking is, is about change management. It's about involving people involved in the process in the project itself. So involving your key stakeholders in the project and getting their ideas on how to improve the process in addition to ideas from learning from other organizations. So, you know, as soon as you go to another organization, it stimulates learning, you know, it stimulates greater creativity, stimulates other ideas, not just what you've learned from another organization. So all, you know, these, these projects are, are great for really generating many, many different ideas and practices, some validated because you've seen other organizations, you've seen them work, some not validated, but, you know, seem to be common sense and we want to test them out. So from this combination of learning from other organizations and a combination of ideas from your own team helps to generate you know, true innovation and next practices. Most benchmarking projects would generate uh, you know, between 60, 70 and 120 ideas or practices. And then it's a team who are undertaking the project with a project sponsor need to decide you know, which ones you know, are going to give us, give us the biggest bang for the buck, you know, which ones are going to generate the most results in the shortest period of time for the least amount of resource. So then it's a case of sieving through all those ideas and practices and deciding which ones to implement. And normally you'd implement, um, you know, a number, maybe 10, 20 practices um, to then get a big leapfrog in terms of um, performance. So uh, in recent times, um, um, my centre has helped to facilitate 34 high profile projects for uh, the Dubai government, uh, many of which are shown here. These, some of these are really huge projects looking at uh, tackling diabetes, uh, looking at um, improving um, safety, um, it's, it's safety of baggage at, at the airport, you know, the, ch the check-in uh, procedure at the airport, um, looking at uh, 
in improving the, the quality of HR in, in, in the country as a whole. So a whole range of different uh, projects, very exciting um, initiative to be to be involved in. And we're always engaged with a project over a one year time frame. And then as projects are assessed at the end of the year to see how well they've done, you know, what results they've achieved. And again, there's like a seven star system to assess um, whether or not the projects have been undertaken in a world-class way and produce world-class results or um, been done in a professional way, but so far have not achieved um, world-class results as such, but still are highly com commended. So there's a whole grading system for assessing these projects where we invite international judges to assess them. Um, on, on this slide here, we share some seven-star projects, but unfortunately I don't have time to share them with you today. But uh, uh, we, I have written three books with colleagues of mine on the projects. And the first two of the books are already published and are accessible for free, again, from the BPR.com website, or again, I can send them to you. The links are shown here. The third book, the one in the middle, will be out, I guess, within the next month at the latest. It's already been written. It's already been, uh, it's already ready to go. We're just waiting for the ISBN number. But um, these are absolutely fantastic projects. Um, Actually, as a result of the success of those projects, uh, just quickly in the last couple of minutes, I know I'm overrunning my 45 minutes, um, uh, we were asked to support the Dubai government's COVID response. Therefore, um, um, back in April uh, 2020, when uh, COVID was just, just becoming prominent as, as, a, as, as a huge health risk around the world, uh, then um, it was decided by the Executive Council's Executive Council Crisis Disaster Management Committee to uh, use benchmarking as a means to quickly learn from other countries around the world and what the best response should be. And so we decided to pull together uh, people right across government who'd worked in some of the seven star projects into, into initially one team to look at how to best respond to COVID. Um, when we started looking at the issue, we, we thought one team was not big enough. We actually split the project into five smaller projects. But you can see here, I just quickly go through I mean, a couple of minutes, the whole project, because to give you an understanding how trade can be used. So for terms of reference, it's about setting the, the terms of reference for the project, the pro identifying the project plan, who's gonna be involved, how many team members, what resources are required. So here we have the terms of reference form, where you can see the aim, the scope, the objectives of the project. Um, so the project was, was actually split into five separate projects. We decided crisis management, health, food security, supply chain, economy, societal behavior should have separate teams looking at those areas. For each of those teams, they would do a SWOT analysis, a fishbone analysis, different, using different tools and techniques to review the current state, which is the second stage of trade. So once you set the project terms of reference, you need to review the current situation. From understanding the current situation, you can do a gap analysis and then identify you know, what you need to learn in order to improve. And so once you identify what you need to learn, you can then um, specify that ideally as detailed as possible. And then you can then go to the acquire stage of trade where you're acquiring information and best practices, learning from, um, other organizations in other countries. So this is for one of the teams which is focusing on crisis management. They've broken down their area through the gap analysis into crisis leadership, effective media control, data control and management, effective and efficient utilization communication channels, future foresight and readiness. And then they use our template forms for doing desktop research, to find best practice information related to those areas and find potential benchmarking partners who could they could then um, you know, have Zoom sessions with to learn more about what they were doing. So that's just more information on, on those forms. Uh, one, of the one of the countries they decided to learn from actually was New Zealand, my country, because uh, New Zealand, um, as you probably are aware, has had one of the most successful responses to COVID. We've only had, I think, 26 deaths related to COVID. Generally, we've been able to live a normal life the last one and a half years. 
with no COVID at all in the community, no need to wear face masks or anything like that, because we've uh, eliminated, basically eliminated COVID most of the time from being in society through strict quarantine uh, protection on the borders. And uh, initially it was very good communication as well with the people inside New Zealand to act in a, a responsible way. And so uh, the United Arab Emirates wanted to learn from New Zealand, for instance, and particularly learn about the communication skills exhibited by um, our Prime Minister, uh, Jacinda Ardern, and look at the very simple way in which we communicated information to the people of New Zealand and stress the need of closing the borders, which obviously some countries uh, did not do. Um, initially, I was born in, in, in I was born in, born in the UK, but I'm from New Zealand now. And again, the UK is an island, New Zealand is an island, and uh, very different approaches and uh, very different uh, results. Uh, so that project was undertaken, um, a lot of learning by the various teams, all that information was then shared with the Crisis and Disaster Management Committee, which has shaped the UAE's response uh, to COVID. And uh, again, if, if the, the UAE is now considered as one of the leaders in terms of its uh, COVID response around the world. So I've run over time, gone a bit longer than I hoped. Um, Hopefully I've not spoken too fast because I was trying to cover a lot of information. I generally do speak too fast. Mistake of mine, trying to pack too much information to, in, in my presentations. Uh, but if you've missed anything or you want to find out more information, please email me. Again, I wish every success to you who's listened to the presentation today. And I wish every success as well to uh, Sandham Associates for the next 50 years. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.